Well, good morning, everyone. This is Sam Gill with the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, to respect everyone's time, we're going to get started here. Folks can join us as they're able. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning on, uh, for a webinar on a very important topic. Uh, there's a lot to cover, so I'll be really brief with our housekeeping. Many of you have been on our webinars before, so you kind of know the spiel. Uh, but if you could keep your accounts on mute, that way we can uh, hear all of our presenters loud and clear and there's no disruption. Uh, there was a question a little bit earlier, but I want to reiterate, all of this information will be recorded and the slides will be available after the fact if you need to reference any of the materials or information that will all be on the Chamber's website. Finally, we do, as I mentioned, have a lot of information to cover today and I know many of you probably have questions and we want to respect that, but if you could just enter those into the chat function, we'll try and get to those uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, with, uh, so that should do it for our, our housekeeping items. I'm now going to turn it over to Kathleen Harrington for a brief welcome. Kathleen. Thank you so much, Sam, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, it, it's a, it's a, a new year, new beginning for all, and starts with a lot of new information. So please know that today is the first in the, the 2021 Path Forward webinar series. Um, we will continue to do all we can to supply you with up-to-date, um, good information. But as always, I mean, we're very, very fortunate today to have our um, generous uh, subject matter expertise here from Dunlop and Seeger and Smith Schaefer. And as always, we urge you if you have questions to make certain that you are consulting um, uh, your own, your accountants, your legal, if it's uh, very, very significant, but we want to provide as much information as possible. So with that, I want to say thank you to you for attending. Please know this will, is a series that will continue. This commitment to provide education continues and will continue strong into the year and on. And uh, with that, we thank you to Smith Schaefer, Dunlop and Seeger, and I turn it over to, um, to them at this point. Thank you, Kathleen. This is Dave Peterson. Um, good to be with you all again, uh, virtually, I guess. Uh, Happy New Year, as Kathleen said. Um, there is a lot of information. If we can go to the next slide here. Um, it, there's a lot of information we're intending to cover here. Uh, you know, the title, I think, in the invite, the email invite, was said new federal pandemic, but we're going to go a bit deeper than that. Uh, as we'll, we'll also touch on some state and local relief measures. So here's the agenda today. We're gonna cover PPP. We're gonna go through some of the other federal program changes. Um, uh, our friends at Smith Schaefer are gonna cover some of the high level tax uh, matters, including uh, employee retention credit, which is now uh, uh, very relevant for many businesses. Uh, we're going to re review a little bit of the governor's orders because that has a significant overlay, certainly into the employee retention credit. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to touch on some state and local stuff and maybe a little bit of what, what has happened with workforce. Um, there's a lot here. Uh, before I jump in, you can switch slide, that's fine. But before I jump into the PPP, I would, I would tell you that you know, over uh, the holidays, uh, our federal government passed uh, an act called the Consolidated uh, Appropriations Act, which was roughly 5,600 5, pages. We're not intending to cover all that, but buried within that are some of these key things like PPP and, and, and the other federal programs, federal relief programs. So we're gonna pull out of all that stuff out of there. Um, just late on Wednesday, for example, SBA just issued about 120 pages worth of regulations. So the one thing I will promise you is that everything we are presenting you here today will not be all of the same in a month. Um, and it's going to change. There will be clarifications and whatnot. I do think it's a little better than the, than the early part of the pandemic as SBA was somewhat, at least in my opinion, making it up on the fly. So now that they've got a little experience with these programs, I'm, I'm hoping that this next rollout is going to be a little smoother. So with that, um, why don't we jump right in? Oh, sorry. Before I jump right in, one last thing. Within, with previous webinars, I know we were in the chat room uh, answering questions. Uh, this one, we're probably not going to do that. At the end, we're going to try to get through as, as much of this as we can on a high level and then hit a lot of the questions in the chat room. A lot of you will have very specific things, I'm sure, particular to your business. 
we'll try to grab themes from the chat room. That's not to discourage you from asking questions. Please ask questions, uh, but uh, we won't be jumping in on the fly on those. Okay, so let's talk about PPP. Um, this is round three. Uh, you may recall the first round was about 350 million that got used up in uh, oh, approximately April, May timeframe. I think it was May. Um, Congress uh, appropriated another 320 billion, and that did not get all used. In fact, there was about 130 billion left in August when the program closed. So this is reopening that program uh, with 285 billion of new funding. Uh, in there, there's a subset that's that's really applicable to first-time borrowers, so those borrowers that hadn't, you know, uh, taken uh, part in the first uh, round or the second round, uh, and then there's a subset for for uh, uh, small employers with ten or few uh, employees. Um, one of the big things, and you may have read read about this, was the IRS had taken a position in the fall that if you had taken a PPP loan and received forgiveness of that loan, the expenses that you had uh, used the loan proceeds to pay for were not deductible. There was bipartisan support um, to say, well, no, that wasn't really the intent. And so now this law fixes that. So um, again, if you get forgiveness of your first loan, you can still deduct those expenses on your tax return. Oh, uh, Dave, Dave, just to jump in here, um, the one thing to note is that um, Minnesota so far has not done anything to conform with that treatment. So there is still a Minnesota piece. Um, if there's any legislators on the line, um, we would like to know about conformity. So um, just so that people understand that Minnesota has not as of now conformed to that treatment. That's great, great point. Um, and I would echo the same sentiments. I mean, certainly when you're talking to any of your state reps, state legislators, state senators, um, you know, ask for that conformity. I think that, that's an easy, easy thing to do. Dave, this is Kathleen. Sorry, but just so you know, at the end of this, we will discuss a grassroots action alert regarding um, that uh, was that Jill just mentioned. So we will be covering that in this webinar. Fantastic. Uh, a couple other changes. I'm going to kind of run through these pretty quick. So there are now, uh, you know, several new categories of eligible expenses. Um, previously, it was, again, interest on mortgage debt or debt, you know, rent and utilities. I'm talking about the non-payroll expenses. Um, they now have expenses that include operating expenses, um, supplier costs, PPE for your workforce, and property damage costs. The property damage costs it really relates to uh, whether or not you sustained uh, some property damage from the unrest. I don't think we have that here, luckily, fortunately. Uh, that's probably you know, more applicable to some other communities. Um, supplier cost is very broad. Basically, it's, it's uh, you know, payments that you pay for goods that are essential to operations that were in effect before the pandemic. Um, operating expenses includes um, software, cloud computing, and other human resources and accounting needs. Very broad. I want you to just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, another expansion is the definition of healthcare costs, um, which are were part of the payroll cost equation, you know, ultimately in how you got your loan. Um, now there's a clarification to make it clear if you didn't do it before that it includes group life, disability, vision, and dental insurance if you provide that for your employees. Um, another another uh, change, I'll call it a clarification is that you can, for your covered period, you can now select any period of time between eight and 24 weeks. So if it took you 13 weeks to uh, use it up and that, that period of time makes the most sense to maximize your forgiveness because of FTE fluctuations, use that time period, work with your accountant on that. Um, they are now, uh, SBA has now also been directed by the law to provide a, a simplified one page certification for forgiveness for loans of 150,000 or less. We don't have that yet, but stay tuned if you're in that category. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is a clarification. Unfortunately for some businesses, if you were not in operation before February 15th, you are not eligible for, when we'll get to this, what I call, what we're calling original PPP, you know, round one or two, or second draw. 
um, which is I'll hit in just a minute here. Unfortunately, for those businesses, you're going to want to look to other relief measures. Um, SBA, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is going to change. They have the ability to modify dates and safe harbors, exceptions for FTE reductions. You may recall, for example, um, if you had an FTE reduction in order to maximize your forgiveness, you had the ability to restore those FTEs uh, and not be penalized. Um, that's just one example. Uh, there is also a, a, uh, a change relative to farmers. Um, certainly, Mike or Jill, feel free to chime in on this. But um, you know, basically, there's a clarification on how they can be eligible based upon their Schedule F income. So yeah, so the clarification there was previously it was, and for Schedule C filers, it is this, it's your net income. And previously for farmers, it was listed as net income. It's now listed as um, net profit, which is before your other expenses. It's after cost of sales, those kind of things, but it's before sort of those other expenses. So it is a, it's a higher dollar number for those farmers. That's great. Uh, Kathleen, I hope you're paying attention. The chamber is now eligible for a PPP loan, uh, as well as local news organizations and uh, housing co-ops. Well, thank you, Dave. But we want our members to come first and get theirs. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get in line after you all. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, and, and you also now have the ability to go back and amend your original application to request an increased amount if you didn't, if, if based upon these rules or the previous rules, you didn't maximize your loan. And so under one of, under one of those rules uh, that were sent out late Wednesday night by SBA, I'm quoting it here that they are developing a process on how you, you know, your lender would collect information necessary to allow you to do that. Okay, this is not second draw, this is amending first draw, okay? Uh, next slide, please. So second draw. So who are we talking about? Okay, we're talking about borrowers that have already taken a draw. Can you get another bite at the apple? Um, and I'm not talking again about you didn't take as much as you could have in the first time. You're gonna, you've maximized your first one and now you get a second one. Um, so who is that? Who would be eligible for that? Um, First, and this got clarified just on Wednesday night, you have to have used all of your first loan. Second, you have to be 300 employees or less, and there are affiliation rules with that. So if you've got you know, uh, common ownership amongst entities, you've gotta, be, you've gotta be mindful of that. That threshold is down from 500, you might remember from earlier uh, first and second round PPP. And then you also have to be able to demonstrate that you've had a reduction in gross receipts on a quarter to quarter basis in 2020 compared to the same quarter in 20, 2019. So I, I put this out there, it's a little ridiculous obviously, but just to reiterate the point that if you're looking at Q1 20, you gotta compare it to Q1 19. Um, we haven't seen any rules yet that say you have to exclude extraordinary income or anything like that. So if you had a big windfall in 2019, you know, it's entirely possible that you would have a reduction but, um, you know, you do also need to meet the necessity requirement. Um, and that necessity requirement, I, I put it below there. Again, it's the same thing in the certification that you had previously signed in your, your PPP application, which is the uncertainty of, of current economic conditions makes necessary the loan request to support the ongoing operations. And if anybody can tell me exactly what that means, I will... Uh, I will contact you when I get that question. Um, one other thing, sorry, just going back a little bit. SBA just clarified that if you receive forgiveness, um, you do not have to include that in your gross receipts for purpose of the 25% uh, calculation. Okay, so if you're eligible, then, then how much can you get? Most borrowers, it's gonna be two and a half times your, your average monthly payroll. Um, and I note in italics there that now the guidance is say basically saying that you can use any 365 day period um, starting on January 1th to figure out your average monthly payroll costs. Um, but for restaurants, hotels, and other, other lodging businesses that have a NACUS code 72, you can use 3.5. Now, 
you can, this is only for second draw. This is not for amending first draw. So again, if you were one of those companies and you took a, a draw maximized based upon the two and a half times payroll costs, your first draw is, is done, but your second draw could be three and a half times. Uh, and when, lastly, how long is this gonna last? Uh, well, the earlier of when the money's gone are March 31, so stay tuned. Uh, and then just lastly, uh, Mike and Jill will be chiming in in a little bit, but there is a significant overlay with the employee retention credit. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to John. Hey, Dave, just a quickly, a real basic question on the FTE. Is it um, employee count FTE or total head count for the 300? Uh, that has not changed. Jill or Mike? Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's, F, it's FTE. It, it's FTE, yeah. It's not, yes. All right, thank you. I think there were a couple other pretty basic questions, and um, one of them was, do we need to count our... Um, original PPP into our gross receipts? And that answer has been clarified as no, you don't have to count. And I've gotten that question from a number of people uh, just throughout, just so that, um, that that's clear. Any confirmation yet, Jill or Dave, of start date for uh, PPP2? Haven't heard anything um, forthcoming. I'm sure SBA is scrambling like mad right now. Good morning, all. Thanks again to the chamber for the opportunity. Uh, my name is John Beatty, and as Dave and Kathleen and others have mentioned, there's, there's a lot to cover. I'm going to just touch on what are likely to be some footnotes in history where PPP has been the star of the show and likely to remain that. But there are, uh, as, as you're anticipating, a number of paths available, none of which are particularly exclusive to one or the other, save for those that we might discuss today. But uh, a couple things that have been addressed in the $2.3 trillion bill, $900 billion of which was made available for uh, COVID relief. Back in the CARES Act, there was uh, relief provided for any of these SBA 7A, I apologize if there's a uh, sound issue here, uh, SBA 7A loan payments were to be made uh, for up to six months by the SBA principal and interest payments for those loans that went into service by September 27, 2020. It's not clear yet if any new loans, there's only 3.5 billion available for uh, this particular program. But those uh, industries that are hardest hit with NAICS codes, as Dave indicated earlier, 70 in the 72 range, they could get up to eight months of payments capped at $9,000 per month uh, made under this extended program under the latest act. You'll see that those payments do not result in taxable income to the borrower for any income forgiveness, uh, and that they also, uh, those expense deductions are not disallowed. Jill or Mike, any comments uh, related similarly to the PPP program for 7A or, or what I'm gonna touch on next? Um, yeah, just a comment that um, your accountants are going to probably need the actual statement that shows which CARES Act payments were made, uh, because otherwise there's no way for us to necessarily know what interest was paid, because there's nowhere else where that will be recorded, and you'll get to deduct that interest. Thank you. So there's good clarification in the latest legislation on the taxability of those 7A payments, and work with your advisors on that. Next slide, please. The idle grant, as you might recall, there was a frenzy before PPP uh, came into any the world. Idle, the economic injury disaster loans was the initial tool the SBA identified for businesses in uh, end of first quarter 2020. A lot of businesses applied for uh, loans or grants through the program. Many businesses uh, maybe never heard back the money I think ran out sooner than SBA anticipated. Some businesses got $1,000, some got $10,000. Not a lot of rhyme or reason. They've now made available through the latest legislation $20 billion additional for idle advances. Those are targeted for what, uh, based on census data, will be low-income communities with employers fewer than 300 employees 
which can demonstrate a revenue reduction of more than 30% in 2020. Uh, that being said, and, and I, I think you have to go out and find the definition of what those low income communities are and, and work with some folks to identify if you could benefit there. There is still another $20 billion in 30 year loans with low interest rates available to borrowers, fixed 3.75% uh, for for profit businesses, 2.75% for nonprofits, and uh, maybe worth working towards that. A, a, um, a great clarification is the idle advance that anyone might have received was a component of your PPP forgiveness application had to be accounted for and overall uh, resulted in a reduction of any PPP forgiveness. The Consolidated Appropriations Act provides that that was not to be the case or, or is not to be the case. And retroactively, those original recipients are to receive uh, repayment of the difference that they, uh, that they might have had to account for if their loan has already been forgiven and if they accounted for an idle advance. Again, these advances are not treated as taxable to any recipient, and you may take deduction for expenses paid from the grant. Uh, I think we still have the question though as to how that is treated with Minnesota tax law and conformity federally with that. Next slide, please. The, this is perhaps the, uh, maybe one of the more interesting or exciting pieces coming out of the last act, a deviation or, or a new element component that provides for some, uh, they're calling it a uh, fighting chance for those businesses that were probably shuttered first and will remain shuttered the longest, the shuttered venue operator grant. Uh, you'll see it called colloquially as the save our stages legislation, a, a, a national independent venue association came together in 2020 to lobby for this type of legislation and was organized. I think that people have been waiting for months and months. And, and in the last piece here, we've got $15 billion that's been allotted to uh, this particular program, benefiting all live arts venues, theaters, museums, zoos, as I've listed here, that have been shuttered or impacted by the pandemic. To be eligible, you have to demonstrate a reduction of 25% of your revenues in 2019. Uh, I'll, I'll make a point, even government operated venues are eligible for this so long as they uh, remain under certain federal funding thresholds. So there is a lot to look at out there related to the detailed list of ownership and other eligibility requirements. Good news for the cultural institutions in our area, I'm thinking of uh, the castle, live, you know, other theaters in, in Rochester. We have the Eagle Center, Maritime Art Museum, those types. Uh, I think most in our region are likely to qualify for an overlay here if they have fewer than 50 employees operating uh, that particular venue. The, uh, the tranches here are set up. So think about a movie theater. Exclusion is for anyone more than 500 FTEs, a business operating in more than 10 states or that owns or operates locations in other countries. That's the broad category for who may be excluded. So to the extent our movie theaters and other venues would qualify, uh, they would have to show for the first wave, uh, which the date start date is yet to be decided, they would get 14 days uh, head start if they can establish 90% revenue reduction in 2019 uh, 2020 versus 2019. Second wave, the next 14 days of the program for those applicants who can't get to 90% but could still establish 70% revenue reduction 2020 versus 2019. But the I think the best news, and the slide doesn't note it uh, probably appropriately, is there is a 60-day overlay for those small independent businesses starting, as I read it, on the first day of the program where uh, those businesses with 50 employees or fewer would be eligible to the $2 billion that's protected in this program for them. The, the amounts that could be awarded grants here are, are relatively significant. It's 45% uh, of the recipients reported 2019 revenues maxed at $10 million. They uh, anticipate supplementing these depending on the length by which these businesses are to remain closed. The decision to be made though 
particular to Save Our Stages here is that a Save Our Stages grantee cannot also apply for PPP too. It, it doesn't matter if you got original PPP as Dave's lined it up today, but you can't pursue uh, for the moment the shuttered venue grant and the PPP2 grant and probably need to start making plans as to which path works best for you and be prepared to pivot if money runs out in this program, for example. Uh, I, it remains to be seen what rules might be if you could then pivot back to PPP2 or not. But uh, a program here that should be considered by a number of uh, local businesses for us. And I believe I'm turning over oh, a couple last comments before we turn it to the tax changes. There have been a lot of anticipated liability protection, a liability shield in the legislation. It was, I think, one of the bigger pieces of negotiation to try to give confidence to businesses to reopen, that they would be protect, protected from any coronavirus related liability. Uh, there may still be some of that time limited liability to come forward in any future legislation. We did not see it come through the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Also maybe worthy of noting, unlike the CARES Act, where there was billions of dollars that trickled down to state and local dollars, ultimately we got about 4 million here in Olmsted County, uh, that state and local aid did not come through the Consolidated Appropriate, uh, the, the most recent legislation either. So a couple components that, that were not addressed here. Next slide. Mr. Malagani. Turn it to you. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, in this first slide here on the tax changes, um, as has been the case the last several years, uh, Congress typically deals with a lot of these so-called extender items at the end of a year or the beginning of the next year. Uh, this was kind of the logical time to get these thrown into this Appropriations Act. So there's several items that typically get extended and, and have been extended just to note that some of them are permanent, some of them are only through 2025. Uh, nothing real specific I wanna talk about on this slide, if we can go to the next one. Uh, a couple of important things to note here. Uh, there was an extension of the energy efficient homes credit. So if anybody is a home builder that has been extended, uh, eligible to claim those credits in 2021. Uh, and the next one is a fairly big one, the temporary allowance of the full deduction for business meals. Um, so there was um, previous to this legislation that the meal limit uh, deduction was limited to 50% of the cost incurred. Uh, that's been uh, changed to 100% of the cost incurred for meals provided by a restaurant. Uh, what is unknown at this point is what exactly that means. Do you have to actually sit down at the restaurant or does catering uh, take out other things like that count. Um, and then the other uh, one I wanted to note is this special rule for flex spending arrangements. So there are a couple provisions that allow employees if, well, it's up to the employer to, uh, to allow it, but if the employer allows it, the employees are permitted to carry over or uh, they get an extended grace period to use both daycare, uh, pre-tax daycare and pre-tax healthcare that's unspent at the end of 2020 they uh, have up to the next 12 months to spend that. So uh, if the employer amends their plan, then the uh, employees would have till the end of 2021 to spend, any left, to spend any leftover funds from 2020. And similarly, they can do, the, uh, do that in 20, 2021 to 2022 as well. Now the deadline, the, the uh, plan does have to be uh, amended to allow that to happen, but the deadline to amend an employer plan is a year after it takes effect. So you actually have until the end of 2021 to amend your plan to reflect that you allowed people to carry over from 2020. So as an employer, if that is something of interest to you, which uh, it should be, uh, you should work with your benefits provider and or legal counsel to get that uh, plan document amended. Um, and I believe with that, I will turn it over to Jill. Jill Rock. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the piece I'm covering is the employee retention credit, which actually came um, from the CARES Act, but was largely, at least for the small business community, a, a little bit ignored because previously you couldn't take it if you took a PPP. And the PPP was a much, much better answer for nearly all employers who qualified for PPP. And so a lot of um, this community, a lot of 
um, our client base too didn't really focus in on that employee retention credit because you couldn't take it if you took the PPP. Um, but now they've said you can do both. You can take the PPP and the employee retention credit. You just can't overlap wages. So you can't use the same wages for PPP that you used for employee retention credit. Um, and they made the provision retroactive for the 2020 credit. So there's uh, rules for the 2020 credit, rules for the 2021 credit. Um, all of the rules for 2020 are retroactive. We think that the IRS is gonna come out with a procedure for you to fix your 2020 through your fourth quarter payroll tax return because that's how this credit is claimed. It's claimed on a payroll tax return. But if they don't, then it's going to be probably amending um, second quarter payroll tax returns. So that still remains to be seen. The other piece is it expires June 30th, 2021. So when we talk about the 2021 credit, it's just the first two quarters. Um, so I'll do a little uh, comparison of the two and then sort of talk about how you're going to interplay that with your PPP. You want to go to the next slide. So for 2020, the credit um, is for either somebody who was subject to a government imposed shutdown or someone who had 50% or more reduction in gross receipts over the same quarter in 2019. And whether you're subject to a government imposed shutdown, Dave's gonna talk a little bit about that um, following this, but the IRS has different rules than necessarily just you were subject to a shutdown, but a lot of businesses, retail, um, dental, other uh, health professionals, um, restaurants were subject at, at a minimum from that March 27th to May 3rd uh, time frame. So a lot of businesses in Minnesota were closed during that time frame. Um, it also counts if you were partially shut down. So if you, um, you know, were only allowed for takeout or if um, a supplier to you was shut down. So, um, so there are more things that qualify for shutdown than just actual shutdown, right? Um, gyms and restaurants, for example, probably haven't been not subject to a shutdown. Um, the other piece would be otherwise, if you have more than 50% um, reduction in gross receipts over the same quarter in 2019. So then the 2020 credit, the eligible wages are um, paid during the shutdown period if you didn't have this 50% reduction. So it'd be just the wages paid during those dates um, or for the whole quarter if you have this reduction in gross receipts. Um, if you have more than 100 employees, then it's only for wages that you paid for people not to work. So they, they couldn't have been working, you paid them to stay home. If you have less than 100 employees, you can pay them to work. Um, you just have to be subject to a shutdown or subject to this uh, reduction receipts. The credit for 2020 is 50% of wages up to $10,000 per employee. So a credit of $5,000 per employee for all of 2020. Um, and again, you can't use the same funds for PPP that you used for this credit. So if you think about 2020, people were subject to a shutdown uh, probably, you know, say March 27th to May 3rd, and you got your PPP in the middle of there. Um, if you haven't applied for forgiveness, it's pretty, um, you maybe don't want to use those wages. You want to use those and get the employee retention credit and use the other wages um, for the PPP. You're also allowed to use 40% of your PPP uh, forgiveness can be non-wages. You maybe wanna max out um, the 40%. The There's a lot of interplay between these two provisions and a lot of very specific to you analysis because it's gonna be per employee, how much the, those employees are getting made, how much you have in FTE reduction and all those kind of pieces. So it is very, very specific, but it's a lot of dollars. So please be working um, with your professionals on this. Um, the 2021 credit is even better. Um, you had to have been subject to a government imposed shutdown or had a 20% or more reduction in gross receipts over the same quarter in 2019. You can use the prior quarter. So for first quarter 2021, you could use fourth quarter 2020 compared to uh, fourth quarter 2019. And it's only a 20% reduction. So a lot of people who are qualifying for PPP draw two, 
which is the 25% reduction in any quarter, are also going to qualify for this, which is a 20% reduction. And so you really want those two things to marry well together. Um, eligible wages are wages paid during the shutdown or during any quarter where there was that reduction in gross receipts. And now for 2021, it's employers with um, greater than 500 employees have to pay employees not to work. If you're less than 500 employees and it's FTEs, um, then all wages count for that qualified period. Um, and this time the credit calculation is 70% of wages up to that $10,000 but it's per quarter. So you can get $7,000 per employee per quarter. So $14,000 credit. So really making sure that, that, that you're using your PPP and your employee retention credit together in the, in the most effective manner is gonna be very um, important. Um, next slide, I think I'd turn, turn it back over to uh, John. I think it's me. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. No, that's okay. So uh, um, I'm just going to cover a little bit because of the interplay, you know, again, to reiterate what Jill's talking about, there's a significant interplay between PPP, the employee retention credit, and whether or not you're subject to a shutdown if you don't meet the, the, uh, the revenue uh, reduction requirements. And so for a lot of businesses, I suspect this is going to be the place to start. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mike or Jill, you know, maybe the place to start is let's do a quarter to quarter analysis between 2019 and 2020. That's gonna help us with, uh, you know, potentially second draw PPP as well as, as uh, the retention credit. And then obviously in 21 going forward, having your, your eye on this thing. So if you aren't in that category that you have a, a sufficient amount of uh, uh, revenue reduction, um, and you, you're saying, but, but maybe I was shut. How do I determine that? Well, here I have a ridiculously long URL that you don't have to copy because as we said earlier, the slide deck will be available, but this is an IRS frequently asked question for that very question that is in the, the title here. Um, you can read the slide, but basically this goes down, boils down. You start with more or less where you essential or non-essential and the distinction being essentials companies were allowed to stay open, uh, non-essential not. Um, I think that's pretty consistent with how uh, Governor Walls has viewed things. Um, but if you're an essential business, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are, you, are, you are ineligible. And so there was a number of examples that they go through. For example, if you have a portion of your business that was closed, or if your, your normal operating hours were reduced, or if you had suppliers that were non-essential and closed, which effectively required you to close because you couldn't operate. Um, but unfortunately, it, it, it not, you know, not having customers show up because they're ordered to stay home does not qualify you as being uh, closed by the government um, and so on and so forth. So there's a few different things in here that you can read for yourself that you can go through. Um, at the bottom, I did want to point out that, you know, if, if you had a closure that was lifted, your eligibility would only be for that portion of the quarter um, up to the date that the, the closure was lifted. And again, these are companies that don't otherwise qualify because of the economics of their situation. It's just closure. Next slide, please. So actually the next two slides, I am not gonna go through these, but I, I wanted to show you that we, we've compiled a list of the governor's orders from 2020 that dealt with closure of businesses, the executive orders. And so uh, these are, hopefully this, you know, you can take this, go through, figure out, okay, help you with the dates of the closure, were we within that category? Um, I also have this in a, a, a word for a, a format that I'd be happy to email, or John or I would be happy to email to anybody, um, or Jill or Mike for that matter. Um, you know, and just trying to figure out your dates again, if you were not one of the companies that qualify from it for an economic reason. So uh, next slide, please. Um, now this is, this is the, the, the executive order that was issued on Wednesday. I suspect many of you have read it. We've been getting a ton of questions on it. There's a lot of ambiguity in it. Um, I'm giving the highlights here. I think the chamber had sent out an email already with these highlights. 
Uh, again, I don't intend to read this to, to you, but here are kind of the high points. Um, like I said, there's a lot of ambiguity and interpreting this, I, I think it's stay tuned is the, the, the takeaway there. Next slide, I think it's back to John. And maybe before we go on, I think a conversation and Jill, this might be a point we discussed with you. I don't mean for it to come across as advice, but a kind of a practice point or a tactic is, is depending on when these programs start, is there a play in which uh, an employer could take the employee retention tax credit at the beginning of the quarter, use PPP through the middle and then come back, maybe talk about that a second. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a lot of the planning that you really um, wanna make sure. So since PPP lets you choose your um, eight to 24 week period, um, you really wanna, even if you get the loan, right, you can get the loan and then choose your period to start a little bit later so that you're using the wages for the employee retention credit at the beginning and you're using the um, wages for um, PPP in the middle. Um, so yes, there's definitely some interplay there. And I might add too, that with the expanded definitions of what you can use PPP for, with the, uh, for the, in the 40% category, software, accounting software, HR needs, supplier, I mean, it, it is, significantly broader than it was before. So, you know, as part of your business planning, let's say that you've had some deferred software needs. Well, maybe now's the time to do it with PPP, try to maximize that 40%. And so that you, you re minimize as much of the overlap between the ERC and the payroll costs with PPP. A lot of words there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I, I see there's still comments about my audio. I apologize. Um, if, if it's incomprehensible, we can pass it off. I think there are some state grants and programs to, uh, to, to keep in mind. And these are in addition to and, and some great things locally that, that folks are maybe well aware of, but to, to be mindful of. 216 million from state relief came down in the middle of December, just ahead of the holidays. 88 of that, uh, 88 million of that was direct relief that the state determined based on records that were maintained in 19 and 20 for unemployment insurance and for sales tax records. They, as noted here, primarily looked at those for the hard hit industries that have been referenced throughout restaurants, bars, hospitality, uh, et cetera. There would be no application for this money. Some of you maybe have already seen this money explicably or inexplicably show up in your account to be directly deposited and directed to you sometime even potentially this week or last week, somewhere between 15 and 45,000, depending on the number of employees of that particular business. Another component of that program had $14 million set aside for movie theaters and convention centers, which have obviously not been able to operate in our state and you can see the caps available there potentially uh, for owners of those facilities. If a movie theater, as an example, those funds could be used for any deferred rent, uh, other things that haven't been paid. Certainly uh, those applications are due, I think by the end of January. Next slide, please. Of interest most to those, uh, most interest to those on the call today is uh, this program that has yet to be uh, decided. Just responding to a question there, there was the 15 to 45K that I uh, made a point of in the last slide. That is the capped amount, it's not per month. It is a uh, payment that the state decides as it evaluates the records from the last two years for each eligible business. Coming back to uh, the, the last half of the money, if you will, from the state is $114 million to all 87 counties based on each county's population. In Olmsted County, we anticipate a receipt by the county of $3.1 million. The legislation allowed the counties in their discretion to stand up programs for those businesses that were impacted by the, uh, obviously by coronavirus and by the governor's shutdown orders. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion yet as to how this program is going to be rolled out for at least some perspective, we can look back at the uh, two, there were two rounds of CARES Act dollars that were uh, administered by the Rochester Area Foundation, 
and ready uh, that managed those funds through the fall, $3.9 million of federal dollars that went out to 250 local nonprofits and uh, for-profit businesses. And I know the county is looking closely at how to continue to uh, take feedback from that experience, uh, the experience by those administrators to continue to get dollars where they need to go in our community. You can see some of the adjustments that I believe are up for discussion as the county looks to finalize, as I understand it, this program potentially even at the next board meeting. Uh, these dollars have to be dispersed no later than March 15th, 2021. Uh, I know some of the points they're looking at are making sure there's greater outreach and translating the applications into additional languages. Comments I see in the chat room are about 501c3s. They've been uh, you know, largely uh, able to apply throughout PPP and the other programs. Some nonprofit organizations, those listed here, C6s, C8s, C7. A C6, like the Chamber, a, a member-driven uh, organization. A C8 is a social club like the Eagles. Uh, those are potentially now eligible in this next round, depending on decisions that they've made. But you can see the list of priority, potentially those most impacted or organizations that can show they were not eligible in the first round through the county programs. Stay tuned for that, though, as there's obviously more to come. Next slide's great. John, John, it's Kathleen. Um, I just quickly, I know we have John Wade on the phone and, and I know you're the chair of Ready and, and John Wade's the interim director. John, do you have any additional comments to add to the, the excellent slide that John just presented? Yeah, thank you very much, Kathleen. And um, thank you to all the presenters. We will continue to work together with the county to uh, focus on some of those areas, including um, C8. Uh, which uh, John just went over. There are also concerns about businesses that were just starting in the fourth quarter of 2019 and how they uh, may be impacted. There, there are a number of, of nuances that we continue to, to talk with the county. The county has been great to work with as we look at rolling out this next round. Uh, but please, if there are thoughts, comments, you can let us know. Certainly the chamber's done a wonderful job of advocacy on this issue. and. Um, share those comments with them or send them directly to Ready. We, we are in regular discussions with the county. Ultimately, the board will make the decision on the 19th, but the county board members want to get this money out uh, to small business and, um, and nonprofits, but the probably 75% will be to business. Um, and we, large, we uh, more than likely would be implement, implementing that, that program. So anything you want to uh, share, we've had a lot of comments from people uh, about the previous rounds and how it could be done differently, please do that either through the chamber or ready directly. Um, we welcome those comments. And, and, and again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank, thank you both, you both Johns for your excellent work on the, um, with the county and, and ready. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Kathleen. I, you know, this slide in front of everyone to close out that anticipated uh, next program here shouldn't be surprised to see these these requirements of being located in the county being in good standing uh, remains to be seen how much the, the county decides uh, it, it could be awarding to any applicant or grantee but for some reference uh, in history we've got 25k was up the max award and 15k in round two so stay tuned thanks john thanks kathleen uh, next slide please uh, following on, on the local opportunities and, and support that our, uh, our representatives and, and our county and city employees have been working so hard to, to provide, this extension of the Olmstead County property tax hardship exception, again, that was just recently adopted and extended work that was done in 2020 to give relief from what is a significant cost to all these business owners and certainly property owners in Olmstead County. There is an application process that would allow for uh, those who meet the criteria list listed here to enter into uh, repayment agreements with the county without penalty for six months, even up to 18 months, assuming that 25% of last year, 2020's property taxes were paid and that uh, you can establish the reduction in revenue, I, I believe that could also even be in deferred rent potentially if you haven't received that rent. Uh, still clarity needed on this program for sure, 
but you can see that uh, that could be another possibility as we eke through hopefully till summer, spring with, with greater vaccination and inflection points that allow us to open even more and, and get back there. Uh, this could be some relief you could plan for and, and take advantage of. A lot of the same industries we've spoken to today uh, that, that have to also pay for liquor licenses on an annual basis and renew those or as they come up for renewal. I know the city of Rochester has about the same timeline outlined a uh, program that gave some relief of both increases in the costs of those licenses and then uh, allowed the license holders to apply and delay or establish a payment plan for those liquor licenses. I don't have all the details, but certainly uh, that's something to keep in mind as you plan for a large expense for your business. If, if that applies. John, it, it's Kathleen again, sorry to interrupt, but for oh. those of you who do have liquor licenses for 20, the year 2021, April to March, you should be made whole. And if you've not received, if you are a liquor, liquor license holder in Rochester, and you've not received a letter asking for your W-9, please let us know at the chamber because the intent is to make you whole, not have to pay any liquor license for that, for that year. Um, if you have an outstanding balance, it'll be written off. So the chamber will be sending out some plain English information about this um, shortly. So, and John is right that for 21, 22, they're not gonna ask for payments until April. They wanna make sure, I mean, until August, they wanna see how things work out. So there's real flexibility being exercised by the city in terms of liquor licensing. And we will um, do our best to get you as up-to-date information on that as possible. Thanks, John. Thank you, Kathleen. I, a question popped in and I, I have to admit, I don't have the exact answer to, uh, how this hardship, going back to the property tax hardship, what impact it, it allows for 2021 property taxes if in fact you paid all of your taxes in 2020 and, and made the county whole. But we, um, I think that, that application will, will provide better direction on that. I would anticipate if you could still show the abatement of uh, or reduction in revenue and that you've paid at least 25% that there's some hardship allowance to, to you if you can establish the other factors for 2021 and to get into a long-term plan. We can go to the next slide. Uh, and, and perhaps one of the last slides, real quick to uh, cut, touch on a couple of um, other issues that have popped up in previous Paths Forward series in the series. Early on, there was that enhanced pandemic unemployment insurance. You might recall that there was $600 per week that was provided for uh, initially through July of last year and a lot of discussion about how that impacted the incentive to return to work, go to work. Uh, irrespective of that, this last piece of legislation has addressed the, the continued shutdowns, the fact that it's, uh, it's just a fact that folks can't go to work or are unable to work and providing an additional federal $300 per week uh, for at least an initial 11 week period. In Minnesota, as an example, if the uh, average unemployment, as I looked at some data is $700 per week, this would bring uh, those employees up to about a thousand or up to a thousand per week based on this. Uh, you might also remember families, uh, the Federal uh, Coronavirus Relief Act provided for, and this is one of the earliest pieces of legislation that mandated leave if employees were impacted directly, indirectly uh, as a result of the coronavirus or a shutdown. If they had a diagnosis of coronavirus in the, fa in the family, among their children, themselves, employers had a duty to provide expanded FMLA effectively to them and also to provide up to 80 hours of paid leave for which the uh, tax credits were available to those employers. The last legislation did not mandate that leave program beyond the end of December 2020. It is, however, optional for employers to elect in and to uh, apply for tax credits if they continue to provide that policy, that leave and expanded uh, leave available to their employees. They can continue to uh, benefit from those credits through this first quarter. And as, as folks are likely to uh, uh, be well aware, there are stimulus checks provided at the individual level for Folks making less than $75,000 per year, you can expect a $600 check. 
If uh, your household has income of less than $150,000 a year, a $1,200 check plus $600 for dependent children. So those uh, were provided for in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. I welcome other comments from Dave, Jill, Mike, as your thoughts uh, or other discussion points. But you know, in closing, we probably say we have as many questions ourselves as, as answers today. Uh, Dave made the great point that these things are bound to get altered a bit by regulation over the coming weeks. But uh, I think all of us see a, a number of new options and, and sort of combinations available to businesses as they try to optimize the programs going forward. Thanks to the chamber for the opportunity. Thank you so much. I, I don't know. Jill is always great at sort of seeing thematic questions in the chat. Are there any there that any of you see that might be um, easily answerable? Well, I think there's one. I see our, our friend Steve Urchel from Smith Schaefer has is, is got our back here, uh, as well as maybe others that are, are noting that apparently it appears that the second draw PPP is, is slated to start on Monday um, with uh, maybe some rollout through next week. So, uh, you know, <laughs> for all the bankers there, close your ears, contact your banker. <laughs> hey Dave, I will say this, Mike, the application is actually not out yet. So this is gonna be a neat trick how they're gonna roll this out by Monday. So right. stay well, tuned. <laughs> um, well, probably can't answer that question of how, but uh, it's clear that our friends at Dunlap and Seeger and Smith Schaefer probably did not have as merry a holiday season as some of us <laughs> having to, to read all of the material to be able to concisely present this. So I'd ask everybody to take yourselves off mute and give them a, fun, a really loud round of applause. Oops. Okay, now you have to go back on mute. So thank you so much for all of the work for that incredibly concise explanation of so much information. And if your heads are spinning, um, I think you're normal. If your heads are spinning with all of this content, you're normal. But as, as Sam said in the beginning, this will be on the website. It'll be available. It'll be sent to you via email. Um, and please, you know, consult Dunlop and Seeger, consult Smith Schaefer. Your other, I, don't think, um, I, I think your everybody heard me yell at him. Your professionals. Um, what? And I want to if, if everybody can go off mute, that'd be great. And I want to just quickly introduce another source of help um, uh, the, from SBDC, Mark Tyne. If you just want to just say hello to the crowd and tell them what's available from you and how to get in touch with you. Well, th thank you very much, Kathleen. This is Mark Fine with the Small Business Development Center. We're located at the uh, Rochester Community Technical College, and we've been tackling uh, COVID-19 calls and stimulus uh, um, packages um, since uh, March. So we're here to help with a group of counselors to be able to guide small business owners through the maze, um, whether that be deed programs, SBA programs, um, or other ones that might be out there for minority business owners too. So um, we're certainly not here to, to um, uh, take the place of the, the knowledge base of all the existing uh, accountants and tax preparers that are out there, but we're here as a resource for those folks to use. Um, our, we provide that information on a confidential basis and, and at no cost. So uh, please contact, contact us at, at any point in time. And if you find your agencies being overloaded with calls, um, uh, you know, other agency directors, please contact me and, and we might be able to assist. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, we really appreciate that. And where you can find the Path Forward webinars, as you can see here on the website, right on the home page, um, in that circled area, Path Forward webinars, just go on that and you'll find it in um, uh, labeled as the new federal federal program. So next slide, please, Sam. We told you about, and Jill mentioned earlier, the need for Minnesota to conform with the federal tax law in terms of the deductibility of PPP. So we are urging you, this is an urgent grassroots action request 
to contact your state legislators requesting full federal conformity for the PPP loans. Here are the email addresses for our local senators, um, uh, for you know, our district senators and um, representative. And on the next slide, please, Sam, there's some key messages you can use. We will also send this out. I cannot stress strongly enough how quick emails to legislators, what a difference they make. Getting 10, 15 emails is a flood and it makes a difference. It gets attention and it has to be done now. They're really working on the um, what's going to happen this session. So the message is basically sim simple. Please push and adopt full conformity for PPP tax loan forgiveness to the federal and allow the deductibility of expenses of my, to my Minnesota income tax. So you can read this, this will be available, but short, sweet, simple, and you know, don't be afraid to do it a few times. The chamber will be advocating. I know the other business organizations will all be advocating, but your voice matters. We can't stress it enough. So please, um, even after this, just get on the, get on your email to those state legislators. So with that, with all of this information, I hope everyone can have a, um, a great weekend. Shopping local, um, just let you know that the chamber's not letting up on our whole campaign of shopping local. Economic, our economic recovery really depends on us supporting one another, our businesses, our restaurants, our uh, hospitality industry, this morning, we had a great session with our fitness, the small business people. We've got to link arms through this, support one another. And you can do so online with, um, you know, many of our retailers have really uh, developed great online capacities. We've got this with the, uh, the websites for the, for the retail directory, food directory. Monday, things loosen up a little bit, all positive news. And please, we have to protect the progress that's been made. I can't stress enough the fragility of opening up what's been opened up. 